Francisco Macias Nguema, the first president of Equatorial Guinea, was a man whose reign would come to symbolize paranoia, cruelty, and absolute power. Born in 1924, Nguema rose to prominence in 1968, after leading Equatorial Guinea to independence from Spanish colonial rule. To many, he represented hope for the newly independent nation. But that hope was short-lived. Despite being elected as president, Nguema quickly turned into a tyrant, he abolished political opposition, declared himself president for life, and began a reign of terror that would leave thousands dead. By the late 1960s, his paranoia and cruelty knew no bounds. He saw enemies everywhere, real or imagined, and he ruled through fear, making sure his grip on power remained unchallenged. On Christmas Eve 1969, Nguema ordered the execution of 186 alleged dissidents. The location, the National Football Stadium in Malibu, and the soundscape for this horrific event, the haunting melody of Mary Hopkins' song Those Were the Days blaring through the stadium's amplifiers, 150 of the alleged dissidents were shot or hanged on the spot, but the final 36 were met with an even more gruesome fate. They were forced to dig their own graves, ditches in which they were buried up to their necks. For the next few days, these men were left exposed, their bodies helpless as red ants swarmed and devoured them alive. This massacre wasn't just an execution, it was a message, a demonstration of Nguema's absolute control and his willingness to go to any lengths to eliminate those he deemed a threat to his rule. Though a common myth claims that the executioners were dressed as Santa Claus, there is no solid evidence to support this. The real horror lies in the fact that this massacre was carried out at all. Nguema's reign would only become more brutal in the years that followed, with mass killings, torture and terror dominating life in Equatorial Guinea until his downfall in 1979. In the early 13th century the Mongol Empire under the command of Genghis Khan was rapidly expanding across Asia, leaving a path of destruction and terror in its wake. Known for their unrivaled brutality and strategic genius, the Mongols were both feared and admired. But perhaps one of the most disturbing displays of their power occurred in the city of Nishapur in 1221. After a series of victorious battles, Genghis Khan's son-in-law, Tokuchar, was killed during an uprising in the city of Nishapur, located in modern-day Iran. Enraged by the death of his family member, Genghis Khan ordered a brutal retaliation, a massacre unlike any the world had seen. When Genghis Khan's army entered the city, they showed no mercy. Men, women and children, an estimated 1.7 million people according to some sources, were slaughtered over several days. But the most haunting part of this massacre was the fate of the city's defenders, particularly the men who had fought against the Mongols. The remaining soldiers were captured and made to lie flat on the ground, and in a cruel, symbolic gesture, the Mongols constructed a massive wooden platform on top of the bodies. For days the Mongol forces held a victory celebration, dancing, drinking and feasting on the very stage they had built atop their enemies. The soldiers beneath them were slowly crushed, suffocated, and left to die under the weight of their oppressors. This wasn't just about death, it was about sending a message. Genghis Khan and his army wanted to instill fear, not only in the city of Nishapur, but in every city that might consider rising up against the Mongol Empire. The sheer brutality of the massacre became a lasting symbol of the Mongols' merciless domination. Though history may debate the true number of victims, the legacy of the Nishapur massacre remains one of the darkest moments of Genghis Khan's conquests, an event designed not just to punish but to terrify the world.
Between 1975 and 1979, Cambodia was plunged into one of the darkest periods in its history. The Khmer Rouge, under the leadership of Pol Pot, carried out a genocide that would claim the lives of nearly two million people, over a quarter of the country's population. This reign of terror is remembered most vividly through the killing fields, large sites of mass executions where the horrors of the regime were fully realized. Amidst these sites of brutality stood one of the most chilling symbols of the Khmer Rouge's cruelty, the baby tree. Located at the Chung Ek killing field, this tree was used for an unimaginable purpose. Khmer Rouge soldiers, determined to erase entire families, would grab infants by their feet and swing them against the tree, The Khmer Rouge believed that if they executed parents but left their children alive, those children would one day grow up seeking revenge. So, they sought to eliminate future generations, wiping out entire bloodlines with one brutal act. The tree, covered in blood, stood as a silent witness to these horrors. Today, the big tree remains as a memorial to the innocent lives lost. Visitors leave bracelets, flowers, and tokens of remembrance on its branches a quiet gesture to honor the children who were brutally taken. It serves as a symbol of the cruelty that humans are capable of, but also as a reminder to never forget the past. In December 1937, the city of Nanking, China fell to the invading forces of Imperial Japan. What followed became one of the most brutal and horrific episodes of World War II, the Nanking Massacre. Over a six-week period, Japanese soldiers carried out unspeakable atrocities, terminating an estimated 300,000 civilians and assaulting tens of thousands of women. But within this horror, one practice stands out as particularly grotesque, the so-called bayonet game. The bayonet game was a form of sadistic entertainment for some Japanese soldiers. They would take infants from Chinese families, toss them into the air, and then attempt to impale them on their bayonets as they fell. It wasn't just a form of torture, it was sport. The brutality of the massacre was so extreme that even John Rabe, a German official who was overseeing a safe zone for refugees was left horrified. Rabe documented the atrocities in his diary, describing scenes of unimaginable violence. His attempts to protect Chinese civilians earned him the nickname the Good German, but he was powerless to stop the widespread slaughter. After returning to Germany, he suffered from severe trauma and required therapy to recover from the horrors he had witnessed. The events in Nanking were so horrific that they still haunt the collective memory of both China and Japan. The bayonet game serves as a chilling reminder of how war can strip away humanity, turning violence into a twisted form of entertainment. In the early 16th century, Hungary was gripped by chaos and unrest. Peasants, oppressed by brutal nobles, had had enough. At the heart of this rebellion stood Georgi Doza, a former soldier turned folk hero, who would lead one of the bloodiest peasant revolts in European history. His rebellion, fueled by the promise of justice and freedom, quickly gathered thousands of desperate peasants, hoping to overthrow their feudal lords. Doza's army initially saw success capturing several towns and putting nobles to the sword. But as the revolt raged on, Doza's forces were eventually cornered and crushed by the powerful Hungarian nobility. Georgi Doza was captured, and what followed would go down as one of the most brutal executions in European history. The nobles, eager to send a warning to any future rebels, decided to make an example of Doza. They devised an execution as horrific as it was symbolic. To mock his ambition of becoming king, they forced Doza to sit on a red-hot iron throne, wear a red-hot iron crown, and hold a red-hot iron scepter. As his flesh burned from the searing metal, Dosa endured unimaginable agony, but the torture didn't end there. Nine of Dosa's closest followers, 
including his younger brother, were brought in next. The nobles had starved them for days, and now they were led to witness their leader's suffering. One by one, they were subjected to horrific tortures, starting with Dosa's brother, who was brutally cut in half in front of his eyes. But the final act of cruelty was perhaps the worst. The remaining men, driven to madness by hunger, were given a sickening choice. Eat the burning flesh of their leader, or face the same fate. Desperate and broken, the starving men obeyed, tearing strips of Doza's flesh from his body with red-hot pliers and consuming them as the nobles watched in grim satisfaction. Georgi Doza's death was designed not just to punish but to terrify the peasantry into submission. His once mighty rebellion was extinguished in the most brutal way imaginable, and Hungary's feudal order was restored. But his execution became a dark legend, a reminder of how far those in power would go to maintain control. In ancient India, elephants were more than just symbols of power and majesty. These intelligent creatures were used in warfare, construction and even ceremonial events. But perhaps one of their darkest roles was that of executioner. For centuries, elephants were trained to carry out brutal executions on behalf of kings and emperors, a method of punishment that was both terrifying and symbolic. This method of execution was not only designed to execute but to send a powerful message. Criminals, rebels or captured soldiers would be brought before the court, and the king would order their death by elephant. The elephants, trained from a young age to obey their handlers, would be instructed to crush the condemned underfoot. Sometimes the execution was quick, a single stomp to the skull or chest, but in other cases, it was slow and methodical, with the elephant breaking limbs one by one, leaving the victim to die a slow and agonizing death. The psychological impact of these executions was immense. In many cases the condemned were executed publicly, with crowds gathered to witness the spectacle. The sight of an elephant, a creature normally associated with wisdom and strength, being used to deliver such brutal punishment struck fear into the hearts of those who opposed the king. But this method of execution didn't just affect the victims. The elephants themselves, after years of being forced to carry out these gruesome tasks, would sometimes become unpredictable. One elephant, after being retired from executions, was known to have executed several people unprovoked, likely traumatized by the violence it had been forced to inflict. New Orleans is known for its vibrant culture, rich history and haunted past. And at the heart of this haunted history stands one name, Delphine LaLaurie. A wealthy socialite by day, Madame LaLaurie threw extravagant parties and mingled with the city's elite. But behind the elegance and opulence of her grand mansion on Royal Street, unspeakable horrors took place. Born into wealth in 1787, Delphine LaLaurie was a well-respected figure in New Orleans high society. But the darker side of her life was revealed one fateful day in 1834, when a fire broke out in her mansion. As the fire spread, local authorities and neighbors rushed to help. What they found inside would horrify them. Inside a locked room in the attic, they discovered the enslaved people who had been held captive and tortured by Madame LaLaurie for years. Their bodies were mangled and mutilated. Some were found with their bones deliberately broken and reset in grotesque ways, forcing their bodies into unnatural shapes. Others had open wounds where maggots crawled, and some had their eyes gouged out or their skulls opened, their brains gruesomely tampered with. LaLaurie's cruelty was unimaginable. She whipped her slaves mercilessly and subjected them to unimaginable torture, turning her home into a chamber of horrors. The fire revealed her sadistic practices to the public, and the mansion quickly became a symbol of terror throughout New Orleans. But Madame LaLaurie never faced justice. As the fire raged and the truth about her atrocities spread, an angry mob descended on her mansion, ransacking it and driving LaLaurie into exile. She fled to Paris, where she lived out the rest of her days, never facing punishment for the countless lives she destroyed. The enslaved people she tortured never saw justice. Today, the LaLaurie Mansion stands as a haunted landmark in New Orleans, a grim reminder of the darkness that lurked behind the facade of wealth and privilege. The horrors of Delphine LaLaurie's actions have cemented her place as one of the most infamous figures in the city's history, a symbol of human cruelty at its worst.
The guillotine is one of the most infamous symbols of the French Revolution, a device designed for swift, efficient, and supposedly humane executions. Introduced in 1792, it was intended to bring equality in death, where both the rich and the poor would meet the same fate under the blade. For nearly two centuries the guillotine stood as France's official method of execution, claiming the lives of countless criminals, political enemies and revolutionaries alike. But shockingly, the last use of the guillotine didn't happen hundreds of years ago. It occurred in 1977. On September 10, 1977, Hamida John Duby, a Tunisian immigrant convicted of murder, became the final person to be executed by guillotine in Marseille. By this time, most of the world had moved away from such brutal forms of capital punishment and even in France the guillotine had become a symbol of a bygone era. But for Jean Duby, the blade still fell. The execution took place at the Beaumet prison in Marseille, where the last of the French guillotines had been kept. As the blade fell for the final time, a chapter of French history closed forever. Just four years later, in 1981, the French government officially abolished the death penalty, bringing an end to centuries of state-sanctioned executions. But where is the guillotine now? After its last use, the guillotine became more of a relic, a reminder of a brutal past. Today, several guillotines are on display in museums across France, including the National Museum of Prisons in Fontainebleau. Others are preserved in private collections or by historical societies that maintain these chilling artifacts. The last guillotine used in France, specifically the one used in the execution of Jean Duby, is held by La Conciergerie in Paris, a former prison-turned-museum, where the infamous device stands as a symbol of France's dark history of capital punishment. The guillotine, which once symbolized revolutionary justice, has now become a reminder of how far society has come in its understanding of human rights and justice. But the chilling legacy of the blade still lingers, a stark reminder of how easy it is to turn punishment into spectacle. We've walked through some of the darkest moments in history, events that remind us just how far humans can go in the name of power, punishment, and fear. But as we've seen, even in the face of such cruelty, history moves forward. These stories serve as reminders of where we've been and how far we've come. As we continue exploring the horrific and mysterious sides of our past, I want to thank all of you, my beautiful weirdos, for being part of this journey. Your support means the world to me, and together, we can keep uncovering the stories that others might prefer to leave buried. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button, subscribe, and share it with your fellow weirdos. The deeper we go into these stories, the more we need your help to keep this channel growing, especially since, as you know, some of my content doesn't always play nice with the algorithm. Until next time, stay curious, stay strange, and keep searching for the truths hidden in the shadows.